Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thank you for joining me. Let's talk about foraging behavior. If you understand foraging behavior, it'll also help you understand the type of habitat management you need to be conducting. So what we're going to do is talk about drivers of foraging behavior, foraging efficiency, and in this case we're talking about spatial distribution of food, and then I'm going to talk quite a bit about forage quality from a standpoint of temporal or seasonal variation in forage quality, and then also spatial variation in quality. I'm going to talk a little bit about plant secondary compounds and then talk quite a bit about the quantity of forage that a deer needs to be successful. Energetics are an important driver of foraging behavior because foraging behavior requires energy. And the animal has, you know, I, I tell my students in, in wildlife management classes that animals have two, two things they have to do really well eat and breed. They have to eat so that they can survive. They have to survive so that they can breed. And as long as they're eating and breeding, then, then they're being successful. The demand and the requirement to search out for food affects activity patterns. Most of you understand that, that whitetails are what we call crepuscular. They typically come out around sunrise and around sunset, and then they're, they're active more during the night than they are during the daytime. If you ever go to a national park where there's no habitat management, there is no harvest of animals, so that there's a, a high overpopulation, there's an inadequate food supply, you will see deer walking around in the middle of the day when you should not see deer. And so they're searching for food because there's so little of it and they have to work a, long, a lot longer time to find it. And so the search for food affects activity patterns if it's not available when and where they need it or prefer it. That total daily energy expenditure is going to be greater if they have to walk further to find it. And if they're having to spend a lot of energy just to get some energy, their overall condition will reflect this if they're not if you're not providing forage in the quantity and quality and the distribution spatially that they need they will have too great of an expenditure while they're locating that food and they'll have poorer body condition and potentially smaller antlers and fewer fawn produced so as forage availability increases within your habitat on your property the energetic cost of finding adequate forage decreases. This foraging efficiency reaches a maximum point once food availability no longer limits intake per unit of foraging effort. This optimum foraging efficiency is what is the target for wildlife habitat management and in particular deer habitat management. This is a figure from a research project on elk, and it shows two different things, travel distance and intake on, on the uh, y-axis or the, the uh, vertical axis. And then along the horizontal axis, you see areas with differing forage density. And this is in kilograms per hectare, but just think of it as 500 is not very much forage per acre. 1,000 is more forage per acre, 1,500 is still more forage per acre, and 2,000 is a whole lot of forage per acre. And if you look at the, the uh, intake rate, notice that when the forage density is low, there's not much food on the landscape, their intake rate is low. As you improve the habitat quality, by increasing the forage density, as you increase forage density, the increase 
an intake rate also occurs because they're better able to eat more because there is more on the habitat. And as the in for, forage density increases from 500 up to 2000, the ability of these elk to intake their food increases dramatically. And at some point, it uh, what we call asymptote or plateaus out. And they don't intake any more than they would, uh, you know, if you produced habitat with 2,500 kilograms per hectare, they're not really going to intake much, if anything more, per unit of effort than they would if there was 2,000 kilograms per hectare. It's pretty much flattened out there. Notice what happens also associated with their movements. You can see it at lower forage densities, they have to move a long way to find that relatively small forage intake. As the density increases, their intake rate increases, and so too their travel distance decreases because there's more quality forage and quantity of forage on the habitat. So intake rate increases and the, the travel distance to obtain that decreases. And that's a good thing. If you're a prey species, you don't want to have to be spending a lot of time walking a great distance to find a small amount of food. If you're walking a long way to find a small amount of food, you are half starved to death. And you're not going to be able to grow big antlers. You're not going to be able to produce fawns. You're going to have some real problems as an animal. But generally, intake increases as forage, uh, as the habitat quality increases, the animals have to travel less, which makes them happy. And that's a good thing. Quality of the diet is really important. Nutrient availability fluctuates in a natural environment. Seasonal changes, weather patterns, there's a raining a lot, it's raining very little. It's hot, it's cold, plants can grow, plants can't grow. These uh, drought conditions, these nat natural environments have a lot of nutrient availability fluctuation. And so natural selection, the pressure upon the animals that live in that natural environment should favor flexible foraging behaviors, especially in herbivores. And this flexible foraging behaviors should allow an herbivore like a deer to seek out and exploit and find nutrients, specific nutrients that are limiting within its food supply. And this is referred to as the nutrient maximization hypothesis. And uh, it's been proposed by uh, some scientists in Europe working with uh, red deer, in this case, the Iberian red deer. And in this study, they showed that Iberian red deer selected forages higher in sodium and cobalt when those nutrients were deficient. If the animal needed, didn't have enough sodium and cobalt, they would actually seek out and find plant parts that were, had higher levels of sodium and cobalt. Pretty cool. It's uh, something you might call nutritional wisdom. However, toxicity is also a problem and avoidance of toxicity is an important diet selection criterion because toxicity can actually impact an animal's condition and reproductive success. Now, I mentioned that concentrate selectors have an effective means of fighting off toxicity, but not all deer are concentrate selectors. Some of them uh, are intermediate between the two types of foraging animals and so their ability to fight off that toxicity can be a little lower in some species of servants. So this nutrient avoidance hypothesis is shown in a, a part of the study where they showed that Iberian red deer avoided toxic levels of sulfur, even if other essential nutrients were limiting. So if a plant could provide them with a nutrient that, that was limited, but it also had a lot of sulfur in it, then these red deer would avoid that species of plant. So again, nutritional wisdom, they are selecting plants that have 
more of the stuff they need and less of the stuff that they don't want. But, so let's look at one of our studies here at the MSU Deer Lab. One of our graduate students, Jacob Dykes, said we wanted to look at how nutrients influence diet selection in deer. This was a, a food plot study, looking at supplemental food plots and looking at a wide variety of species of plantings to determine how what might drive a, a deer to actually uh, select one forage over another. We had this long strip and we had actually several strips like this in one of our experimental forests and we had a series of different forages planted with exclusion cages. You can see them in the video there flying over with our drone and each of these forages was monitored by a trail camera and you can see the variety of forages from left to right. We have Durana clover, winter peas, arrowleaf clover, bob oats, crimson clover, forage wheat, rape, cereal rye, red clover, ladino clover, chicory, bursine clover, turnips, balanza clover, and one patch that was left fallow. And those forages were randomly assigned to each of those plots. So what Jacob found was really interesting. Whitetails spent much more time eating forages that had higher protein contents. So the whitetails, when it came time to choose which forage out of all those that they wanted to eat, they were looking to maximize this valuable nutrient, protein. And they tended to avoid fiber, which if you remember earlier, concentrate selectors try to eat low fiber, more digestible forages. So they avoid fiber. That's fiber is, think of it as the cellulose that we talked about, the non-digestible part. So this fiber is not digestible. And so they try to avoid that. And they also avoid sulfur, just like the, uh, the red deer in the Iberian, in Iberian Peninsula. So whitetails are using nutritional wisdom, selecting the forages that have the highest protein and the lowest sulfur and, and fiber. Here we can learn quite a bit about forage selection by plotting crude protein and sulfur associated with the different forages that we had in Jacob Dykes's study. And we arrange these in this particular uh, figure from the lowest crude protein value to the highest crude protein value. So running uh, chicory was down around 2% crude protein and uh, Ladino clover was up around 17% crude protein when it was sampled. And then the sulfur is uh, represented by the red line. And you see certain uh, species of plants, uh, forage plants, actually were quite high in sulfur. You see chicory is high. You'll see rape is very high. And also turnips are very high. And so deer are choosing for higher protein and avoiding sulfur. Which plants do you think they would want to eat out of those uh, sets of plants in our study. Red clover, balanza, arrowleaf, and ladino clover. So those four clovers were actually our most preferred forages, and it was well explained by the con relative amounts of sulfur and protein in them. So as you're managing your plants and your habitat for deer, you want to try to minimize sulfur content and maximize protein. That's just two nutrients. But this, this is an example of some of our research that helps us understand what deer select for and why. I love to look at deer foraging. Uh, this is, this is a, uh, a video, some videos that Rainer Nichols, another of our graduate students, had taken by video cameras at his uh, stump sprouts. This is a study uh, you may hear about in, a, in another seminar, but uh, he cut off trees and created stump sprouts of three different species and you can see the the deer using their mouths they're stripping with the side teeth and then pulling up with their front teeth to remove those leaves uh, black gum is a highly preferred forage and, and they really like that they also like red maple which is a a moderately selected forage uh, here in uh, mississippi and Interestingly enough, 
They, the third species that, that Rainer used in, in his study was sweet gum, which is a very low preference forage, but you can see even sweet gum was eaten off of uh, stump sprouts. So that just shows you a little bit of foraging behavior. So the bottom line, understanding that deer are concentrate selectors, that means they select for highly digestible, high quality forages, low in fiber, and they're going to even look for the parts of the plant that provide the best nutrition for them. In order to do that, they need to sample and evaluate a lot of different plants within their home range. Across the southeastern United States, there have been a number of food habits studies that have shown more than 400 species of plants have been eaten by white-tailed deer. That's a lot of forages. Now, I'm not going to tell you in this presentation what the best forages are for white-tailed deer. I can't possibly make that statement because they are going to eat what they need to eat. They're going to eat the best, most digestible, highest quality plant parts that are present in your habitat, in your region, wherever it is that you live and manage for deer. They are going to select the more digestible, higher quality plant parts, and then some species of plants are better than other species of plants. So they're gonna pick the species that is optimum and the part of that species that is optimum, the most palatable. Now, generally, the most digestible, the highest quality plant part of any plant is early in its growth stage. If you look at the picture on the left side of the screen, you'll see a vine, the brown stem is the older part of the plant. And it is literally lignified, it's, it's part woody based on that brown color. And the leaves are a dark green. And right next to it is a, the growing tip of this vine. And it has leaves that are very, very light green. And the growing stem up near those leaves is light, light green. And as you work your way back from the very tip, you see the leaves get a little bit darker green and the stem starting to get a little bit, a little browner. Now, based on what I've told you, if a white-tailed deer was going to be eating some of this vine, which of the leaves do you think they're going to pick? If you said the, the growing tip with the light green leaves, you are absolutely correct. That's the most digestible, the highest quality part of the plant, this plant that is shown in the picture. So I'm not telling you which species deer go, are going to eat. They eat literally dozens and hundreds of species of plant. What you want to remember is that they are going to eat the growing parts of the plants in particular.